Well, that is a very wild, energetic, and imaginative score, John. It's um, You're really doing things that are very different from some of the other entries. Uh, I, I'm not going to say the average entry because there don't appear there kind of doesn't really appear to be anything in the way of average about any entries. They're all really different from one another, and even ones that seem to follow a certain trend um, all have huge differences inside them. So, um, but I, I would just say that like a lot of the freeness of the interpretation uh, really does make this entry stand out. Now, having said that. I will say that I'm wondering if sometimes you are um, possibly, I, I don't know if it's a misinterpretation or maybe like a, um, a, a, a kind of a transformation of the original intent of the score. Like uh, sometimes you've got a passage where, you know, obviously you know, we're coming back to this idea and then we're going to, you know, and then we're going to come back to this idea, right? So... So the the repeat of this idea, the the front end of it is sort of cut off, and you continue the arrangement style into the next idea, and then then you sort of jump back to that other approach, right? And you, you know the the problem here is that this is really heavily motive driven music, right? The 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 themes connect the different ideas and. Uh, like realizing them with a certain amount of continuity, I feel strengthens the um, the meaning of the music, right? So, in in sort of more freely interpreting it, I think you you may be. Uh, I'm not sure if it's if it's if it's uh, worse or anything, you know, better or worse. That's a that's really subjective. But I I don't know if it expresses the meaning of Faya's original meaning as effectively. All right, but we we will talk about that as we go. All right, I wanna I wanna play fair with this and really keep it within context and not get to be too sprawling with me picking out everything that could be fixed or not or whatever. I'd rather talk, you know, look down holistically at the entire drift of the music and see what I can help you um, from phrase to phrase. So uh, our first concern in our list of evaluation criteria is pitch weight in the upper or middle register of the orchestra is not a concern. You're spreading out your orchestration. The concern about the thematic material repeating quite often, uh, possibly sounding repetitive if orchestrated the same way throughout in both of these phrases, that's not a concern. You are, um, you know, you are, are being different what you know, like they, they would say different to a fault, but there's there isn't a fault here. It's just it's just a different interpretation. So really, really quite different. So let's take a look at those two sections, right? So um bum 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 Um There's a little bit of a drop off here. You're just going dun 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 and then you're stopping, right? So it really should be you should really continue for one more beat right because it's it's Faya is playing around with the rhythmic phrasing right he's it's almost a three two it's almost like one and two and three and a so it's almost like three groups three beats of half notes or you could think of four plus a two right <clears throat> so you've got to maintain that so as not to to try to turn it back into a 3-4, into like a really regular 3-4. So if you're going to continue on with your Bs here, then I think you should continue on with the everything that all the supporting harmony here as well in your in your other winds. And then like here you kind of drop out, um, and this is sort of puzzling me. I'm seeing this a lot in some of these arrangements. Like we've got piccolo here and then it drops out and then you've got horns below. And I mean, I, I do like that. I, I I like the change around, but <clears throat> I would just say, like, you know, maybe make it more, um, uh, not uniform, but like more, like like for instance, you've got you've got this supporting part from the xylophone, and then you drop out here, and then you come back, and 
So like leaving the when you leave the piccolo out here, it, it feels more like a mistake than like a a um, a judgment call, right? So I would say try to try to have more kind of more regular differentiated approaches, right? So like maybe drop the xylophone out here, and then the piccolo being absent and the xylophone coming in over the horn makes more sense. Now, I, I feel that, like, you should just continue. Bum, 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 bum. Like, if you want to add this below in the third and fourth horns, they're not really doing anything. Um, yeah, it's strange. you got some crossed-off symbols and some other things. Maybe it's just translating that way in the PDF. It's weird. Okay, well, anyway. <clears throat> But, I mean, yeah, like you're trading over to Trumpet here, and I don't know, I mean, I just feel it, it needs to be a little bit more cohesively scored right in here, All right? All right, but still, you know, I mean, it's a strong idea, it just needs to be a little organized. So jumping over to the next part, um, it's it's a little less clear, like, like you, you know, you're you're doing more of a kind of a, of a brass chorale type of scoring, and you you really take different approaches each time, and I almost feel like like the page turn is is to to some extent like defining what you do next. Do you see what I mean? At, at like you know at the page turn you drop out on your trumpets, right? And it almost feels like you got to the page, got to the next page, and then and started continuing on, and maybe that's why that it's a bit of a like there isn't really a carryover in the or in the style, right? And and then almost as if like you scored two bars, like turning the page, scoring two bars, perhaps thinking that you were finishing up the the phrase, but kind of taking a bite out of the next phrase coming up. Do you see what I mean? So the you know that that whole <clears throat> that whole continuation of the melody. Um, somehow got got sort of um, stuck out of kilter. So like so there there isn't a real strong start to the um, uh, to that you know <clears throat> yeah we don't really like there's a little bit of running up to the um, up to the like we're headed to headed for this you know for these high e's in the in the piano score right but it there's something a little disjointed about it right like the the um the phrase doesn't doesn't really connect smoothly right but <clears throat> you know all the same and it's really intriguing the way you know what you have scored here um is is very cool uh you know once again just kind of like i said here like just a more sense of a um kind of cohesiveness in each two bar phrase would be good you know like if the you know if you you have this approach here that's cool and then like maybe like this approach could collectively be covering two bars rather than kind of trading off from from trumpets to horns and so on so <clears throat> so let's talk about a little bit about the the next concern in the criteria, which is melodic melodic development soaring quite high, accompaniment figures covering a wide range. So, you know, one thing I just would sort of point out here is that I, I think it's interesting you make the choice to go very high in the first kind of the first two bar phrase, and then in the second one you really kind of drop down, of course, because the piccolo can't really go higher. What if the piccolo started, like, what if you just didn't go for it? Like, what if this were the highest part of the phrase? And the beginning were, like, this line were actually in the flutes, where it's very, very easy for them to play, and you didn't bring in piccolo at all, right? And then you get that nice smooth line going all the way over and connecting, and then, you, of course, you can drop the flutes down here and so on to join the oboes if you like, or just leave them out, because the oboes are strong enough. And, yeah, and, and then, like, second trumpet, like, here you've got first trumpet, second trumpet, and first trumpet again. There's really no need to divide this up like this. Your first trumpet player should be able to play this all the way through, right? 
I think you maybe you're dividing them up so that people have got breathing space and so on and so forth. But you know, a good first trumpet player should be able to play all the way through here without any need to trade off to save their lip or anything. And nothing is really going all that high. It's not all that strenuous. And um, and that is their job, right? To to really play this. So so once again, like I I just sort of feel like th these four bars could uh, you know there's there's nothing really hugely wrong with the way that everything is scored. It's more that like there needs to be kind of a sense of continuity and a sense of following through, right? Like not only do we go higher here, but we achieve this huge fortissimo, right? Which you know in all the instruments except for I guess that's sort of strange the trumpet goes softer to mezzo piano here and then you kind of have this echoing phrase right when like in the music that's like where the music like gets gains most of its strength in the piano part right so here you're kind of spending it's almost like you're spending the money first and then you have a little bit left over right rather than saving it up so maybe maybe the dynamic phrasing here is a little backwards and and so on so like maybe it needs a little bit of a rethink here i do like the idea of the you know of the kind of swelling into it and everything else now here like you know although it's a, a little disjointed it's still very strong so it just why it sort of puzzles me and and, I, and i'm thinking you know i sort of have this theory that perhaps it was because of the page turn and you know, this ended up being a, sort of an interpretation of what was going on the piano in the piano score as if it were actually these two bars, right? And I sort of cut the nose off of the, you know, dun 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 dun, which kind of isn't in the music, right? Um, so, so I'm not going to really judge this too harshly or, or really kind of put it through the ringer, but instead I'm going to jump to the. Um, the other concern of these two four-bar sections, and that is the accompaniment figures uh, covering a wide range um, of pitches and wind registers. And here I feel that this is a place where you definitely could be stronger. You've got cellos covering the accompaniment figures, but look how look at how much enormous weight you have in the melody, right? And almost nothing in the accompaniment. So right in here, I think you've got bassoons that are doing nothing. You've got trombones that are doing nothing. They could be supporting, uh, doubling the cellos. They could be trading off with you know, different pitches within themselves and just really fulfilling that and balancing the roles of accompaniment versus melody, right? So, so that might be a place where you could rethink. And then right in here, we kind of don't really have any accompaniment at all. It's basically all just um, doubling of the melody. I mean, there's a little bit of accompaniment sort of in right in, right in here. Right, but there's there isn't a sense of continuity with the, you know, with a, with a melody plus accompaniment, right? That the that doesn't quite follow through. So so anyway, so something that maybe this needs a bit of a rethink, um, and you know, of course, like the whole one last little thing about like continuity is that in the piano score you know or however you're going to to do the the um the rhythmic slurring but you know one way or another we're leading up to this big triumphant high e right and you know here it's it's sort of lower and 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 that's that's fine i mean i, I don't mind that you're sort of changing the tack on it it's just that like there's a that we're sort of missing the sense of like upward push, right? Because things are getting softer in a lot of parts instead of louder, right? So xylophone, uh, horn, and trumpet, and so on. And this, of course, should be like the that should be the first horn player, I think, not the second. Yeah, you know, sort of certain key phrases. You give it to the give it to the strongest player. Give it to the player who's got the you know the most. Um, the most responsibility. Now here I'm noticing that you've got things like F, nat F sharp, F natural, F sharp. So if this is meant to be an E sharp, score it as an E sharp. If this is meant to be an A sharp, score it as A sharp, right? So just really, uh, you know, don't... Uh, so here, the problem right here is I'm just going to talk about, uh, for instance, you know, why why we should stick within um, diatonic scoring, even if you end up with like white key sharps uh, and flats and double sharps and flats, is because 
that your violinist is fingering this with one finger following the other, right? And whenever you change the, the accidental on that finger, they move the finger. They don't walk back to the previous finger, right? So if this were being held down by the first finger, the, the first violinist would be tempted to just just to slide their finger back and then move it forward, and it's just a complete hassle. Whereas if they saw that this was an A sharp, they would use their second finger here and then <clears throat> lift off to the first finger and then put the second finger back down and then walk up and so on. Do you see what I mean? So like, so don't do these kinds of things like going from a um, a natural to a flat to a natural. If really what's intended there is a like an A sharp. So just watch watch those kinds of things, and especially and also with with horns and so on. Everybody's used to reading those kinds of notes, so don't please don't worry about that. Okay, <clears throat> so now we're getting to um, to this section in here, and and it, you know it's kind of interesting. Like like my concerns in the criteria are um, you know a sense of relentlessness if there is no change in the textural contrast. That's not an issue. Um, you're constantly shifting the textural contrast. Uh, and, you know, maybe maybe sometimes a little too much, right? M maybe there needs to be more continuity across four bars. And I, I would say just in general, like if you think of each four bar section as its own kind of logical uh, bit of sound, right? We're, we're kind of developing within those far, four bars to something else or, or progressing the texture from the beginning of the four bars to the end of the four bars, but in some way having some continuity, then I think that you'll, you'll be way more on track. But anyhow, uh, uh, this is all right. Um, yeah, I like the oboes and the, and the horns stacked like that. You're bringing in more voices. That's cool as well. But you're kind of dying off in, in the, the force of the <clears throat> of the of your uh, of your string accompaniment, right? So like, I think there should just be more strings involved, right, in here, especially like viola. Why are they dropping off here? You know, why aren't there any cellos in here? And the, the other danger too is turning the downbeat here into part of the overall phrase, which is something I've mentioned a few times. But like, this is actually the end of the phrase from before, right? Ya da 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 da, and then the the next phrase starts on beat two. Right? Two, three, one, two and three and one, two and three and one, two and three and right. So that's so so maybe like just end and then you can throw in your your sort of aggressive down bows. Now if you really want a row of down bows, don't mark one of them staccato. Just have them all uniform in terms of their articulation, right? Because this is a this is a essentially a tenuto mark, right? Because you're asking them to kind of almost do a sort of a zooming motion, almost like a slashing motion with their bow over and over and over again, like jumping up and and just playing that same down bow again and again. I would not put down, 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 up. I would say just like, just have this an up bow under and, and just rather than having it, you know, da, da. Have a da. I mean, you are sort of setting up these little pairs, right? But you're not you're not really throwing in the articulation, the appropriate articulation here. So I don't really know what to think. And you also have these um, these nice strong half notes, right? So I don't so I don't think that there's any need for you to to kind of cut this cut this in half like this. Um, I think it should be I think it should just be one big slur. And, you know, so just you can just be down, up, down, up, down, up. It's just like, it's just so much more natural. Or, you know, or if you're thinking about it the other way, like in the terms of the, the phrasing, you could go down, up, down, up, down, up, right? There's, so there's a, a number of different ways that it, that some of this can be worked out, Um and I would say try to match the same articulation style in your winds and your strings right here. But I really love this. This da 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 da. I think that's really a cool idea, right? Um, maybe like once again, there's there's it's a little disjunct, right? Like here the violas come in and then they disappear, right? And there's then suddenly the strings start here. 
right? Maybe it would be better to have a more kind of cohesive approach here, just, you, you know, where the, where the instruments gradually introducing themselves, gradually trading off rather than just coming to a dead stop. Maybe if you really want to trade off with the, the, the trumpet timbre here, um, start soft, like start piano, uh, and then here have a diminuendo down to pianissimo at the end, right? And then you get the trading off quality. But you know, just be careful about throwing in xylophone everywhere. I'd say just really save it for specific little things because like the xylophone tries to make everything about itself in the, it'll, it'll just really dominate. And then when you stop it all of a sudden, what happened to the xylophone? Right, it it tends to tends to distract attention from all of the beautiful orchestration that you're doing in other places and just focus it on it. Right. So I'd really, you know, I wish I could spend more time on that first screen because there's a lot more to say. But <laughs> this is kind of funny. There's a huge forte sign. So um, so we're getting to the next part. And, and it, it's a little strange, like we're like this part right in here is a little underpowered, right? Because you, you're still sort of digging away at these other things and throwing in all of these um, these down bows. Don't get too um, don't get too attached to this whole idea of throwing in a bunch of down bows in a row, right? Because here, like you just neglect it, right? So there there isn't any there isn't any resonance between the two things. So I would say if it's not that important over here, then it shouldn't really you know. All you have to just write is deliberato here, and the players will just play intensely, and you'll get the sound that you want, and you don't need to throw in all those down bows, right? And and maybe you could support the, you know, the, there could be a little bit more power in this. See, so, so the thing is, like, the problem here is that you have really intense, you know, this really intense uh, scoring right in here, and you've got this this line right in here is doubled bass clarinet and uh, and violas. Right, so it's, it's it's a very very committed kind of string and wind scoring, and you have the oboe on top just kind of chuckling along. Right, so is is this one single oboe line enough to carry the melody against all the you know the accompaniment style? And then then there's the whole like it's a it's a call and response, right? It's da 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 da. And at that time, there's a at that point there is a right. So that's the response. So you're turning the response into the melody again, right? And so the the sense of differentiation where is the melody now? See, it just gets a little it's it's a little vague as to what is. You know, where the um where the focus of the melody is on and you know and, and I'm not I'm not taking anything away from the you, you know you have this wonderful need to sort of move through colors and to change things around I, I don't want to take anything away from that but it's more a matter of defining the functions clearly right so you can you can move everything around just so long as the like especially the function of the melody since this is mo really motive driven work right just you know the the motives interacting with each other that's really the the part that makes the scoring the strongest right so um maybe not elevating this you know just like suddenly leaping up to you know an octave or two higher than where it is in the piano score right i mean it's still really cool scoring like you can hear it in the mock-up and you can hear it you can see it on the page it's very intricate in a lot of ways but it's just sort of like where is the where is the theme I, i'm not really sh clear on where that is so yeah da, 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 da. and once again not a there isn't a lot of follow through right so it, and then it just really kind of leaps up so i'm i'm just a little unsure then we get to here okay so so here like there's I mean, you, you have a nice, strong statement of the melody, right? You've got the... Bum, 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 dum, dum, dum. We've got that um, coming through on these nice, long held notes, the octaves in the violas and, uh, and violins. And horn, this is actually something I did as well. Used horn there. 
Uh, and then we have our triplets, right? Okay, so there are a few problems here, and that is like one is the uh, the baseline just sort of drops out, right? Do it up, right? It like we're like what happens? Like it, uh, you can really feel the sudden absence of the baseline in here, and also there is like this this sort of you have this you sort of throw in this sort of very smooth these smooth low contrabassoon lines which are kind of turn into like doubling the melody from way below um so there's a chance that this is going to interfere with the bass function right in here right so if the bass function is becoming less clear to you as the arranger that might be why it gets dropped out here right But I mean, like, I'm not really seeing anything that's all that impossible for anybody to play. I mean, and I like the like, little bits of reinforcement here and there, like the flutes on top. And I mean, there's some really cool stuff about this. Uh, just, I, I just say, like, really be careful in sections like this that, like, try not to cross, like, to cross the line so much, right? So you've got this, um, you know, you've got this melody here in the flute, and above you've got the oboes going dee -dee 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 -dee. so it's like really kind of hard to figure out like where's the melody. Like so and you've got the the A and the G kind of clashing right here, which is I mean it's that's that's fine, but it's just in terms of like where's the where's the melody up here, right? So I th I think maybe you know that's that's the big concern with this screen or with this section, I would say, in the in my evaluation criteria, like maintaining differentiated roles in closely spaced melodies and overlapping accompaniment figures, right? And since you are throwing in so much variety across the course of 16 bars, and you're just really changing the approach constantly, um, I think that you may be losing track of, of balancing the, the functions, like the, those inner voices, like highlighting certain ones, having other ones become more subsidiary. Uh, keeping triplets from overwhelming the melodic line um it's just just hard when the when the when the triplets are crossing the melodic line right and then but i mean like the very last um the very last concern which is keeping the textural contours fresh and not too much the same you have basically checked that box with the you know with one of the biggest pens <laughs> right so that that is not a concern. You really are keeping things differentiated, and you know I, I don't want to squelch your sense of creativity. And I, like I said, this is you know one of the most imaginative uh, kinds of approaches of just just constantly shifting and changing and and working things out. But but you know maybe maybe there's just a little too much you know in, in, in a in a way just like too many different um, like the the variety is so much at times that it's hard to really kind of track where the main idea is right so maybe just reining it in a little bit will make the the other features of the score stand out better and then like and then the imagination that you're applying to it will um will be even more powerful in contrast Okay, so so here you're starting to kind of pile on the texture, you know, da da dum, da da dum, da 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 da. All right, and the bass line is coming back now a little bit, but you know, I would say just try to make the bass a little bit more consistent. Like we've got a touch of tuba in here, and then the cellos and the double basses, and yeah, um, yeah. Okay, now now here's where we start to get into some some concerns. Um, like here it says slow down, right? And if anything, the score started getting faster. And then when we got to here, um, that whole, um, I don't know if you noticed in the original score, uh, doppio più lento ma sempre moso, right? So, um, in other words, twice as slow, but just a little bit faster. Right. So, so, so in other words, like he's, uh, I, if you, if you saw the materials that I provided, it, it is a, you know, it's a quarter note equals a hundred. And, you know, that's, that's where most pianists are keeping it. So maybe those changes, those, um, those, those, 
tempo changes. Just, you know, you intended them, but they didn't make it into the mock-up, right? Which is completely fair. But if you were kind of expecting this to continue on without that tempo change, then I would say, like, you kind of need to rethink it because a lot of things are sort of coming off maybe the wrong way. Like, um, you know, like the kind of the timekeeping here with the xylophone is almost sounding like a like a sort of an old-timey um, a telephone like not the not the not like the triangle like when you have a triangle trill it sort of sounds like a like a, a telephone ringing but like I don't know if you've seen like those really old like crank handle type um, telephones in in movies that that kind of has more of a xylophone trill kind of or tremolo kind of a sound right so um, so yeah so it's just like maybe I, I can't really tell whether you know what the intention was here whether that was you know where you whether you did really intend this to get slow and then and then to be you know dopio pulento so um but yeah uh, but the only critique that i would say here is like you know my evaluation criteria say i'm looking for in my orchestration thomas goss's orchestration a convincing all Argondo expansion and a smooth release into bar 49. So that's, that's, I didn't feel that here. And if you're going to return to this, I would say consider that when the pianist is playing this and they've got their foot on the pedal and they are slowing way down as they expand, you know, they have this huge crescendo. They are like those notes are holding on, they're sustaining because of the damper pedal. And there's also the, you know, the kind of the the big colors of the piano starting to sort of spring out at you but just because of the pedal and the lower notes exciting the upper strings, uh, even though the, even the ones that aren't being played, right? So there's this just magnifying sound there. And so if you're going to rewrite this, come back to it and so on, I would say just think about the some of the pitches holding on as they ascend, right? So... Some people solve this problem by having like maybe a clarinet covering most or all of the pitches. And then as the clarinet goes upwards and some of the notes that they're playing that are the same get held longer, right? A bass clarinet, I'd say, rather than just clarinet. So, so there's a bunch of different ways of doing it. Uh, but I would say like, just like think about like rather than just kind of fluttering upwards through all the pitches that are in the piano score, like maybe holding on to some of those pitches as you go by. It doesn't have to be all of them, but just some certain key ones, like, you know, certainly like this E and, and um, you know, maybe this G sharp right in here and so on, just certain certain things, certain essential parts of the, of the harmony. And then that way you can release into the into the next section logically from those pitches, which are being held from before, right? It's sort of like the it's kind of like the chords changing, right? Just like the same pitches changing and just lifting and going to the next thing, right? So I'll just I'll repeat once again like the the whole concern about xylophone trying to make everything about itself, you know, you know, kind of like. Like, you know, your annoying neighbor who, you know, like you're, uh, you, you've got a fellow neighbor and their house is burning down and, and you're, you're out there and they're, you're helping to put the fire out and this other annoying neighbor is there and you know, all they want to do is complain about their fire insurance, right? Well, this guy's house is burning down. So, you know, that's, that's the same thing as the, the xylophone here. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of keeping up this kind of rattling sound above and all of the beautiful noise that's, you know, all the beautiful arrangements that are happening below are, are just really, the, the ear is really completely distracted from them because of the, the prominence of the, of the xylophone way up here. So I just say really watch out with that. All right. Now, um, it's pretty, it, this, this seems to make it clear uh, that you are intending a, a measured tremolo, right? But if we're going um, doppio pulento, and that was what you intended, then it, it may not be, you, know, you may want actually an unmeasured tremolo there, right? If, uh, you, you know, maybe you were playing this back and it just seemed like that was fast enough, right? In your, in your mock-up. But now thinking about this actually going twice as slow, but a little faster, 
right? That that you might you might actually want a um you might want actually just want unmeasured tremolo, or you, maybe you do want the measured tremolo so that you get that bump, 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 bump kind of ad adaptation of the original idea. Okay, so so like kind of just thinking about the treatment of the melody. Um, if you want things like this, like trading off from oboes to flutes. You want that to be a really smooth trade-off. Try to have a, a dovetailing note, right? So have the uh, have your ah two oboes end on an on a sixteenth note E to trade off to the flutes, right? Or you can have the flutes. You can do like a a dynamic trade-off where the oboes diminuendo here down to pianissimo, and the flutes come from pianissimo and then crescendo to to mezzo forte over the same four notes. That's another way of making it feel like you've traded off from one to the other. But, you know, I'll just say that, like, it's the the sudden abrupt change in quality here will be noticed, right? Even though you're doubling with with clarinets and and violins, just suddenly changing from oboe to flute. And, and I, I don't really see the need for it, right? Like, here you are sending your, like, you're having your flute player here, ah, two flutes, play in a weaker register, while doubling things, and you're also marking them down to mezzo forte, where they're harder to hear. So what's going on there? And why why do we have a diminuendo here and not here? All right. So it's just some some things, just a few kind of it's a, a little bit non sequitur ish, you know, if you know what I mean. Like some things don't seem to really follow through. Like I, I can see. Like right here, you've got octaves, right? You've got A2 flutes, A2 oboes on top, and then um, English horn an octave lower. And the English horn is really not strong enough to completely carry this. Like if you really want this to be evenly balanced, then, you know, and plus like the trumpet on top, you really barely hear the English horn with you know even a single trumpet on top doubling all of these winds and the violins right so the english horn isn't really contributing very much here so you might want to double that but then you have this massive octave melody so maybe maybe you need to lighten up a little bit on your on the on your melodic texture you know maybe there just are too many things going on at once. But I mean, I really do like the, the idea of things just really searing right in here. So, I mean, it. I'm not, I'm not saying it's wrong or to change it or, or not, but these are just things to think about in terms of like the overall shape of what you're doing here. Right. And then just kind of yeah, I mean, I, I like this. Flute, English horn, an octave lower, bass clarinet. Yeah, and like the trumpet in the middle with along with the violins. Now, this is, this is a little strange to me. You have this beautiful soaring uh, slur right here. Now, why is the violin turn, chain, like just kind of chopping this down? Like, Pretty much any concert master is going to come and just like scratch all this out for their section, and then just put a nice big long slur over it, right? You know why? Why? Why kind of hobble this? Because you just imagine they're them changing their bow constantly. Eh, 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 you know, is what you're asking them to do. Where everybody, where everybody else is going, yum, and here they're going, uh, 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 uh. yeah. I just don't think that it really works as well as you think it is right here. Yeah, and a lot, a lot of the stuff is pretty workable. Yeah, I mean, I like this. I love the horns right in here and this big jump up and the bass clarinet. That's, that's very, very cool. All right, so now we're getting to, like, a section where, you know, I've, I've, I've sort of skipped over a few things. Accompaniment pattern, keeping it from becoming too regular and predictable and so on. Careful treatment of the melodic voice to make it feel authentic to the composer's style. I think that you're covering some of those bases really well. So managing the sense of restraint. So and and here I think that if you had really gone doppio pulento, right, 
then this would this would be way more effective. You know, um, but then like things just get insanely fast right in here. Um, over over these, you know, especially right in here, it's just and then poco afratando, it's like prestissimo, right? So I'm just feeling that's just like way back if you'd thrown in that dopu pulento, this these changes would make a lot more sense. So yeah. At the tempo that you're going here, like it's not, you know, these sixteenth notes are, are not going to work, right? Uh, but at, at Dopio Pulento, it's beautifully playable, right? So just maybe that is the problem. Um. So here, like when you're increasing in force, I don't understand why you're going to a single oboe player, right? So, you know, just in, in order for the, and then, and also why the, you know, flute and then oboe. I don't understand that either. You know, I don't understand why the oboe drops out here and then the flute drops out there. So, you know, just maybe, maybe a bit of a rethink in that. And then, like, also, if you're going to have, like, this lower voice right in here, maybe set it up. Like it could, you know, ba 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 da 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 and you know, some of this dropped down a little, right? Like you've got, you sort of doubled this lower part in the cellos. What if this were being played in the cellos, doubling with bass clarinet, and the it was the clarinets or the English horn or both that were playing this an octave lower with the second violins also doubling that or violas, con the, doubling the continuation of this. Then I think that that would be more effective. All right. All right, and then yeah, and then yeah, just at the speed that you're going, this is just insane. It's just I don't see this happening um, without it just kind of starting to fall apart at that incredibly fast speed. Poco affrettando of doppio pulento is what fire means here. So you know just. Yeah, not going to presto prestissimo. But I mean, it, yeah, if it is, if it's poco affrettando of the slower tempo, then this is more or less possible. Yeah, especially for bass clarinet, it's not too hard, and clarinets and so on. Yeah, I mean, should be hard. the tuba is a little dubious there. I I would score this more as as um I would score this as as staccato rather than uh, than as slurs. I think it just it's just easier on the player or just like without any articulation or slurs. Maybe throwing in a little bit of a of a um, of an accent there at the end. So yeah, so once again really engaging score and to really really go through it and to like fix a bunch of bits and to explore it and perfect it to where you would want it to be probably would you know take another couple hours of discussion and also talking to you face to face and it really would become more of an orchestration lesson and like rethinking a lot of parts and so on um so i would say like when taking this on just really think about like following through think of the phrase groups you know like like a four bars of this four bars of that and you know you can progress the texture from one texture to another and you can do trade-offs from textures to textures but just make sure that the functions of the of the parts are really really clear whether you're trading them off or you're keeping them consistent right 
Um, and then I think that that as a vehicle for your imagination, like all of those little parts that you want to throw in will just be incredibly strong, right? Mm-hmm. Rather than than being part of the the thing that sort of pulls the rug out from under the the idea, right? But I mean, you know, I mean, such such there's so much imagination and color and life in this, and just it's so powerful, you know. I'm I'm not putting it down at all, but um, you know, you you brought it for me. You brought it to me for advice. That's the advice that I'm giving, right? Is that there the um, cohesiveness can, you know, the if that is fixed up, you know, so that the so that the continuity is really strong throughout all the parts, then like the 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 kind of the way that it's sort of fraying and coming apart um, will actually become this big strength of having you know not being locked down into any one particular kind of approach right and you know definitely ways to do that uh and definitely worth pursuing for you john it's such a such a provoking score thought-provoking score um for me to look at and i really really appreciate it so i'll just wrap up this session by thanking you so much for the huge amount of work you put into this just like all the different ideas and the different places where you went i mean you have five entries worth of approaches stuck into one entry right you know there are you could you could sort of pick out any particular bar or line or passage or whatever or section of a passage and create like just that that approach could just go for the entire four bars right so um so yeah it's just it's just really fascinating how many different ideas you came up with and the way that you are kind of mixing your colors and everything else so that's that's really something that is worth acknowledging and and of course like the support that you have given to the channel is you know it's not just helping me but it's helping thousands of composers out there get better with their craft too so um, yeah, this community is just getting stronger and stronger, and I'm so happy. I'm so proud of everybody's progress. I'm seeing um, people who join the community as, you know, just starting as students at university, and now they're teaching university, right? There are people who started, you know, as just basically gamers who wanted to get into game composing, and now they are composing for, you know, some major companies. There are people, people are just doing so much great stuff with their work, and... Um, you know, it's obvious by looking at a score like this and, you know, thinking like this is, you know, this is one of our entries, you know, people are able, you know, they've got the, you know, whether, whether or not the opportunities are out there for everybody to take hold of, there's absolutely no question that the talent here in this community is just powerful to take on, you know, many industries of uh, the needs of many, many different types of, of professional scoring out there. So thanks so much. Thanks to you, John. Thanks to everybody on Patreon. And just awesome troopers, people on Patreon making comments on the website evaluations and vice versa. It's amazing. And thanks to everybody who is subscribing to this channel and is is participating in this uh, orchestration challenge, whether you've submitted an entry or you're just watching and enjoying this. I really appreciate it. Thanks all. <laughs>